guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn, I'm so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. I love you so much, thank you for supporting me. It means absolutely everything. I can never say it enough and I never will stop saying it. I appreciate you guys so, so much. Um, I curled my hair with a pencil crayon today. I don't know why I choose to like experiment with things in my hair on filming days, but here we are, can't go back now. All right, today's story is a long one, so we're gonna get right into it. So get your beverage of choice, grab your little snacks, and come and hang out with me. I had never heard about this case. Um, this is a case that like media dubbed Killer Landlady. I don't know if you've heard of this before. It kind of ruined me and my perception of old people just temporarily, because I'm the kind of person who like when I especially like especially when I see like an adorable older couple, I just want to like squish them and put them in my pocket like I just think they're so freaking cute but I mean this broad she she got me for like a couple days where I had trust issues with little old people I mean essentially I guess what she she was charged with was murdering her tenants she had a boarding house and the tenants that came to live at her residence were on social assistance so basically she she killed them to continue collecting their checks and then buried them in the yard but I mean, there is so much to the story. Like when I first read it and shout out to my favorite, I guess, I mean, I look at him like an uncle. He's a wonderful family friend of ours. He's the one who showed me this case. And then when I was skimming through it, I was like, oh, okay. Well, like, I mean, that's bad enough when you just give the synopsis of somebody murdering their tenants and then burying them in the yard. But there is so, so much to this woman and this story. And there were so many chances for authority to stop and prevent this and they didn't so yeah just just buckle in guys because this is this is a rough one i'm gonna go get my drink i'm drinking a nude today a little gin soda lime flavored i like these because they're like 100 calories do a little asmr <laughs> but i don't do asmr i like to put it in my little wine glass so that i look classier yeah, I'll, just, I'll leave the ASMR to the ASMR artists. Like an artist, like our ASMR artist. Is that what they call them? ASMR artists? <laughs> I think I just made something up. Okay, yeah, this is just me before like any gin, so welcome. Okay, so let's get into it. So Dorothea, her mom and dad were Jesse James and Trudy May Gray. And despite the cool names, they really weren't that cool. They were quite awful to their children. Uh, Dorothea was born on January 9th, 1929, and she was sixth of seven kids. They were quite neglected. Dorothea's parents were alcoholics. Her mom, from what I could gather, a little bit more than her dad, and and she was also quite a bit more aggressive and abusive than her father was. Her dad was a World War I vet and he was severely injured with mustard gas and it led to him being diagnosed with tuberculosis. So after that, he was really, really depressed and just never the same. I read reports that he had even tried to commit suicide in front of the kids. So they, they dealt with a lot. I think he was kind of always in and out of hospital dealing with his depression. Um, their parents worked odd jobs so they didn't have a lot of money the kids took care of each other so the older ones took on the you know parental roles of taking care of the little ones and they would like scavenge for food on their own so that they could be fed every night and while Dorothea's dad was in and out of the hospital instead of her mom being there to take care of the kids she would just go off for days at a time sometimes even locking the kids in closets so they couldn't get out and get into trouble and she would run off with this biker gang that she was associated with. Some people speculated that she was also prostituting. When they went to school, it seems like this is where Dorothea started learning that she could disassociate from her home life by making up completely different identities and lives. Obviously something that she just like hoped and wished she could be instead of where she actually was. So this one time when she went to this brand new school, the new kid in school, everyone is like curious, wants to get to know you. And at the time there was like a newspaper at the school. I think that was like, pretty common years ago. They had that and so the paper wanted to interview the new student 
And Dorothea presented herself as like a foreign exchange student. So she spoke with an accent and said she had a very hard time speaking English and everybody believed her. And that's it just not the case. She speaks English. She was from Redlands, California. This is something that will like follow Dorothea into her life. She just embellishes things and creates this like false reality and so that she can like escape the one that she's actually living. So in 1936, the family ends up moving from Redlands, California to LA. Dorothea's dad's health is going like further and further down. He's spending a lot more time in the hospital. So the majority of the kids were dispersed between relatives. Dot, she stayed with her mom and you know, Trudy still was very absent and not always there. And I think like she had this internal struggle because she absolutely hated people who drank and drunks based on like what her upbringing was. But it almost seems like she she still wanted to stay close to Trudy. And then it, a a year after they moved, her father Jesse ended up passing away. And then not even a year after that, Trudy ends up losing custody of the rest of the children that were still at the house. And Dorothy ends up going to an orphanage. She's not there very long. And then she actually becomes a real orphan because her mom ends up dying in a motorcycle accident. So now both parents are gone in a very short amount of time. And then this is where Dorothea decides that she is gonna start living with relatives like her siblings and they just kind to start ping ponging the kids between places. So at 16, she's had enough of it and she runs away from home. Uh, she ends up going to Olympia and getting a job at like a milkshake parlor. She was a very attractive girl and she got a lot of male attention. So she, she started prostituting to make ends meet. Several months into doing this, so she ends up meeting a 22 year old soldier. His name is Fred McCall. And Fred knows all about Dorothy's career choices. Fred's cool with it though and um, they end up being able to get legally married because Dorothea just lies on the marriage certificate and she says that she's 30. They ended up having two daughters between 1946 and 1948 but it was like described that she she despised being a mom. What unfortunately ends up happening is one of her children ends up going to live with relatives and then the other one goes up for adoption. After this she briefly leaves Fred and moves to LA but she comes back to try and save the marriage I'm assuming and her way of trying to save it was to have another baby. This time she miscarries so they never have that that third child and after that the marriage just falls apart and they get a divorce. It sounds like this divorce was Fred's idea. He said that he couldn't trust Dorothea anymore and all of those like lies and like quirky traits and stories she made up before that he thought were like endearing. He was like okay I don't even know if you know what's right and wrong anymore or you know part of reality is fact or fiction so he left and Dorothea she just can't deal with rejection at all she kind of seems like the person who if something's gonna end it needs to be on her terms and so since this wasn't from this point forward when anybody would ask about her first husband she would say that he died like days after they got married. I mean, that's just not the case at all. I think he outlived her actually. But like that was her way of just like, instead of saying, oh, he left because you know, I'm a pathological liar. She just killed him off in her, in her mind. So after the divorce, she moves to San Bernardino and she's struggling trying to find work. So this is where she starts to realize that she can make money, you know, living the life of crime. She does that by stealing checks. This is her, her MO that that's what she likes to do. So she starts by befriending this woman and then steals her checkbook. She goes to a department store and tries to buy $88 worth of shoes, but the store clerk was like really suspicious. She was acting really sketchy at the till and he just ended up saying something's not right here. And instead of saying, what are you talking about? Like these are mine. Dorothea just books it. Like she just and hauls ass out of the department store and runs away. She gets caught and oh, she's arrested. So first crime out the door, you'd figure, you know, it's a sign maybe. You're not supposed to be doing this. You tried, didn't work out. Let's move on to another venture. But no. So she goes to jail for four months and then she's put on probation, but she ends up leaving the city. Then when she leaves, she just changes her name so that no one's able to find her. And for that charge, I believe she was able to evade the police and never 
got caught with that again and served more jail time for that. So in 1952, Dot finds her second husband. His name is Axel Johansson. Sounds like a movie star, like a something like that. Anyway. And I don't know, it didn't sound like she was very interested in nurturing this marriage from the get-go. She was very absent. She would just like leave for weeks at a time. Very much so like mirroring the way that her mom treated her marriage and acted like what she saw growing up, it sounds like. And this goes on for several years. It sounds like during this marriage, Dorothea just starts to let herself go. Like I said, she was very appealing and attractive and that was part of like the draw from people to, you know, want to spend some time with her. So she let herself go, wasn't putting like as much effort into her appearance or her health. So business for her was really slowing down, but it wasn't going to stop her. So instead of her having, you know, her steady flow of clients coming in, Dorothea decides she's going to open up a brothel and then like get what she can and like reel in the clients she can to make a little bit more money. But if she wasn't, you know, of someone's standard, she had other girls that she could hire and work there as well. I think she had high hopes for it, but it doesn't last very long. Quite soon into the business opening, she's busted by two undercover cops. So she serves 90 days in jail for this. When she gets out, she goes back to Axel and now he's like, I can't take it anymore. I don't wanna be a part of this lifestyle. So like Fred, he decides that he is done with the marriage. This time after getting caught, Dorothea decides, okay, like maybe this whole like prostitution biz isn't my gig, it's not for me. And you know, like, okay, we're like, great. Perfect, Dorothea, you're, yeah, you're starting to get it. Maybe start a restaurant, maybe start a little ice cream shop, I don't know, but no. Dorothea decides she wants to make, you know, like the same kind of money, and she thinks the way that she can do that is by scamming the healthcare system. She figured if she could gather a group of like marginalized individuals, specifically, you know, alcoholics or people with mental illness or mental disabilities, then she could have them, you know, like a little housing unit, she could control finances coming in and steal the social assistance checks that were coming through. So she makes this unlicensed healthcare operation and she, she names it the Samaritans. Yeah, she's a wild one, this one. And inspectors and social workers, they were just like button hooked from the get go. They thought she was this godsend to them because these were cases that they were having a lot of trouble placing. It wasn't individuals that a lot of group homes wanted to take on. And Dorothea was willing to take these really difficult cases. And you know, I got you, I'll take them and love and nurture them. And so when social workers would come around, she was like the perfect host, perfect caregiver. She had the house, you know, she made sure that they they were always like clean and their appearances were like very top notch. So these social workers would like see these cases, you know, coming back to the office and seeing that they look like they were really being well taken care of and they just couldn't, couldn't get enough of Dorothea. She would even go and throw like parties and get togethers and like wine nights for the inspectors or the social workers, you know, have an appreciation night for all the biz that, uh, that they were bringing her. And so what they don't know is once Dorothea gained trust with the boarders, she would have them switch over on their social assistance checks and then Dorothea would be the one who would control it. So she would give them like allowances. She would even reach out to family members and say that they had illnesses and embellish their sicknesses so that the family would send more money to her as well. Like sometimes she was making like five grand a month and in like the 70s, that's a decent amount of change that you're making. Now on the outside, Side, she seemed very sweet, she seemed perfect, and that she was, you know, taking care of everybody so well. Behind closed doors, Dorothea was a violent drunk. She would never really drink in public and definitely wouldn't get belligerent in front of people, but at home and in front of her tenants, she would often get very drunk and on these like rants, sometimes they would turn physical. This was just a side that nobody else was seeing except for the individuals in there, and it was almost like that situation where who are you gonna believe. Her thing was just, it was preying on groups. It was, you know, getting a foot in the door in a situation where she saw that people were vulnerable or needed help and just making herself that epitome of, you know, like a savior and the one who everybody could trust. So apart from Samaritan, she involved herself in the Hispanic community. When she was a kid, she learned how to speak Spanish. So she was able to build trust with them by speaking their language. This was a group that 
but really struggled. And Dorothea came in as somebody who wanted to really help them. It's things like that where you're like, it's a battle because you do see there are often times where she's done good in her life. And then you question, okay, how can somebody steal, you know, from vulnerable people? And then you're using that money to do good and try to build up this community. It's a bit, it's a big battle. So she ends up meeting a guy who is 20 years younger than her. His name is Roberto Jose Puentes. Ooh, I felt like it was a little bit Spanish. This marriage was very, very short lived. And in this time frame that it lasted, every single day was like a chaotic, it was described as just like a very volatile marriage and it only lasted two weeks. But it sounds like that two weeks seemed like two years because it was just that much of a Brain wreck. And so with this one, it sounds like she got a little bit swindled on this. I think he thought since she was going around, you know, presenting herself as this very affluent woman who could help the community and, you know, put on these charities and fundraisers and donate to so many causes. I think he thought, you know, she was a lot more wealthy than she was when he found out that maybe wasn't really the case. He left her. And so we already know Dorothea doesn't do that well when people leave her. So her story about him was that she found out that he was like a closet homosexual. So she ended the marriage because because he was gay. So after this divorce, her business uh, starts to fail and she files for bankruptcy. Instead of her, again, you know, taking the opportunity to maybe revamp the whole career path, she decides like, okay, this, I, I'm really onto something here. This is a really great idea. Yeah, it, it failed on this scale, but I think what I, I need to do is just go bigger and take this to another level. So she ends up subletting a three-story house at 21st and F Street. This was like a very grand house. It was Victorian style. It had 16 bedrooms. She divided it like according to class, you know, like the Titanic where you got like first, second, and third class. So Dorothea did that with this place. Um, in the basement, she had her, her poorer tenants. And these were the people who were on like regulated county assistance. And then on the second floor, there was the more affluent who were on like federal assistance. So she had those there and then she took like the entire top floor to herself. And again, social workers and anybody who would refer these cases to her they loved her. Some of the social workers who spoke about this case after, they said that the only red flag that they really saw with Dorothea was that she, they could tell she was a little bit of a liar. Where some people that she would encounter like bought it, a lot of these people didn't, but they just like brush it off as very innocent and like almost, you know, like, ah, she's old, let her just think that. But she said that there was a time she was a doctor. She also said that she was a lawyer at one point in her life. She was a socialite and best friends with Rita Hayworth. She even told some of these people that she survived the bombing of Hiroshima. So it seems like these like, you know, innocent tales, but they don't know that this is just like a pattern of her life where she's she's actually just psychotic and, and a compulsive liar, which is unfortunate that they didn't catch on, you know, sooner, even when the doctors would come in and do uh, house calls, Dorothea would want to be like right up in there. And then she would let him know, you know, like, if you need assistance, like I got you. Um, I was I was a nurse in World War Two. So I know what I'm doing. Again, like I think they thought, Oh, yeah, no, we're good. And that's okay. And just kind of shrugged it off. Meanwhile, in the basement, they don't know that she's got a whole setup down there where she's got these fake medical degrees like hung up on the wall. And she has, you know, like medical equipment, like the blood pressure cuff. And what she used to do is take these people that she had built trust with in the Hispanic community and have them come there if they were saying that they weren't feeling well or needed checkups and she'd do these checkups on them and sometimes even said oh you know like you've got a vitamin deficiency we'll take care of that and she would like inject them and say she was giving them a vitamin booster nothing was reported of anybody like being injected with something down there at that time and just like dying it could have been water for all we know but it's almost like she just got like this thrill of acting like she was this like caregiver and doing it. It's like playing nurse when you're like a kid, you know, like sh shoving like a pencil in your little doll and think you're just curing them of whatever illness they have. It's just when you realize that she was actually doing this to people, it's just 
It's so creepy. But I mean, people trusted her. I think they just thought it was one of those qualities of her. She did a lot of good within the community. She even donated to like political campaigns and she is photographed seen dancing at, with a governor at this ball in like the 70s. There were even pieces about her written in a Spanish newspaper. So she was getting recognition. And I think that that is something that she really, really craved. But it only took her so far. Cause I mean, it's one thing to, you know, have people know who you are and be spoken about and be recognized, but on the inside, she was really lonely. She was always searching for companionship. So oftentimes what she would do is she would just get like dressed up to the nines. Of course she had like nice clothes cause she's paying for it for these poor people who are renting space at this boarding house of hers. And it's one thing I think that like drew people to her like to trust her because she presented herself as a very successful woman. We know that she ended up giving away her two daughters, but later on in life, she would take on a very maternal and caring and nurturing role to young girls that were struggling within her community. She would refer to them as her stepchildren or her adoptive children and she she really did provide for them. And a lot of these women, as they grew up and once everything came out of what Dorothea had done in her life, a lot of them defend her because they say that if it wasn't for her, their life would have been completely different and not in a positive way and everything that they have and all the successes that they have in life, they really attribute to what Dorothea did when she stepped in and took care of them. So it's just a... Uh, it's just a struggle when you know that she does good and she's got these like moments of this almost light shining and then you have to bring yourself back and be like, oh, it's it's all being funded on lies. So in July, 1975, there is a worker doing some remodeling and renovations on the house. Pedro Mondalvo, yeah, no Spanish in these. Mondalvo, Mondalvo, Pedro. And something happened with his living situation. So Dorothea, um, you know, invites him to come and rent out a room in her place and so they build a friendship and start spending a lot of time together Dorothea never invited people who were living there up to you know her own quarters but with Pedro she she would so he was allowed to come up there and like chill with her over the year they start getting you know closer and closer and in 76 they decide to get married oh yeah and I forgot to mention this with the other marriages so they get married in Reno and that's where that's where she always gets married you'd think at one point she'd be like well maybe this isn't the best of luck out here um Maybe I'll switch it up to a different location to get married, but that was where she liked to, to wed. So anyways, they get married in Reno. This time it was people who knew Dorothea who didn't trust Pedro. They thought that he was using her for her money. They also said he was like really hyper, so they didn't like his energy. Like it was just like a lot for them and they didn't know how to read him properly. They just, they, had, they felt like something was fishy going on. And he was 10 years younger than her too. So just based on that dynamic, they were concerned for Dorothea. Again, this relationship was over pretty much as soon as it started to. It sounds like Pedro, I think very similarly with her previous marriage, he finds out that she doesn't have a lot of money. But I think that he also started suspecting that Dorothea was stealing this money from her borders because with the depletion of this relationship, her story for this one was to make people really hate him. So instead of, you know, just like killing him off or saying that he was gay, this time she said that he was very abusive to her. She told people that he stabbed her between her eyes and that he broke all the windows in the house, that he slashed her tire and even said that um, he killed one of her cats. So she really wanted people to hate him and, and build this like distrust. So I'm assuming maybe if he were ever to be like, um, I think she's stealing. They'd be like, well, you're a cat killer. So in 1978, a former boarder of Dorothea's named Robert was serving some time in jail. He was awaiting a social assistance check and it was late to come. So he was getting really upset. I believe he ended up calling over to Dorothea and was like, yo, where, where's my money? There's a check that's supposed to be there. This check ends up turning up and when it arrives, it's got his signature on the back of it and he he didn't sign it. So he knows that Dorothea has been forging checks and cashing them on the border's behalfs. Behalfs? 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 Yeah. Uh. 
So Dorothy is denying that she did that and Robert's really pissed. He doesn't let it go. He ends up uh, contacting one of the social workers and they open up an investigation. And then they end up finding that there are so many checks that have been forged by her. And when they confront her, Dorothea just denies it. Even with proof right in front of her, she looks at these checks and she's like, oh yeah, no, that one I, that one I had permission to do or this one too, they said I could do that. But regardless, she was charged with forgery. And in this case, this is one of those cases where you're just like, oh, instead of serving time in jail, she was given leniency just based on her age. She also embellished health issues. This is around the time as she started getting older, she learned that she could, you know, present herself like a little bit more frail and sick. So she would lie about having like cancer or I think she, she also told some people she had like a heart disease. So her lawyer's strategy in this case was to like really push that frailness. So she ended up not having to serve any time in jail. She was ordered to serve five years of parole. And then she was also ordered to receive um, counseling and psychiatric care, which I mean, I think that's like the, the most positive part of that sentencing that came out. She 100% needed like a lobotomy in my opinion. But so after this conviction, she obviously lost her boarding house and she lost a lot of her reputation too. Um, a lot of these people who trusted her now realized that the way that she was funding all these charities and donations was through stealing. So she she had no more credibility in the community. She kind of had to go back to you know square one and she starts getting odd jobs here and there at like restaurants. And she kind of appears to be, you know, a little bit on the up and up. She's maintaining all of her court ordered appearances and appointments. And then she just falls back into old patterns and she gets caught forging another chat. Again, with this time, she pays it back very fast. So her lawyer argued that, you know, she, it was just a little minor slip up. She realized the mistake she made. She quickly wronged it. Let's just, you know, chalk this one up to like a little bit of a fail and let her, you know, continue on this, this new path that she's, she's been on. In that case, she was never prosecuted at all. She was never charged with anything. They, they let it go. So here's another opportunity where, you know, she could look at it and be like, let's not dabble in this lifestyle anymore. We've learned our lesson, but no, Dorothea decides she wants to get involved in this individual assistance gig again. But this time she's decided that, you know, it's a better idea to scale it back and just operate on a smaller scale. So in order to make the same kind of profits as she did when she had like a bigger place, she wants to start advertising herself as a nurse so that she can have medical, you know, funding assistance. While she's waiting to find a company that will take her on as a nurse and freelance her services, she's at one of the bars and she meets a gentleman named Ricardo Odorica. Odorica, yeah. It's, this is getting worse. I don't know if it's the gin or just me, probably both. So Roberto's quite a bit younger than Dorothea. He is married. He's a gardener at a hotel just down the road from the bar that they're at called the Clarion Hotel. He has two kids at home and he gets to chatting with Dorothea, you know, about his life and his accomplishments and just how proud and excited he is because he recently just purchased his first house. This house is at 1426 F Street and it's a cute older style home, but it needs a lot of work. They get to talking and Ricardo says that they were putting a lot of work into it and that they had already renovated the first floor, but the second floor, it was just a shit show and needed a lot of work. And Dorothea had said that she had recently lost her husband and she was struggling and she was really needing a place to stay. So she said she would rent out that second floor from him. He was like, no, like it's it's really not livable. I couldn't do that to you. But she insisted, she said she was familiar with it for, I mean, I don't know how, but I mean, she's lied about worse. So she insisted that she wanted to rent out this house. Right then and there, they end up leaving the bar and going to the home. She meets the family. And from that point forward, she ends up renting that second floor for $200 a month. And she becomes really close with the family. She takes on this almost like a grandmotherly role to these two little girls. She helps any way she can with Ricardo's wife while he's at work. I believe she was 
even a sponsor at one of their first communions. So they they consider her family. Dorothea was making ends meet by getting hired from either different nursing homes or assisted living contracts. It sounds like she was a part of one main company and then they would just like like rent her out. I know there's a word for this and my mind is completely blanking right now and you're all probably telling me what it is and I don't know. So we're just gonna go with that and move along with the story. So she would go to different care facilities or different homes and it just goes to show like how manipulative she was and how much she played that like innocent, sweet elder lady role because no one bothered to do a back check to find out that Dorothea actually wasn't a nurse or qualified at all. They just took her word for it and they just like sent her out in the field and let her just like take care of whoever the hell she wanted to. So it's here that she meets an elderly woman named Esther and she's providing in-home care for Esther. So some of the nights she's required to sleep there and everything seems to be going well for about a year. And then Esther started getting violently ill and these episodes would happen very sporadically. She would come into the emergency room and look like she was like on the brink of death and not gonna make it and nobody was able to detect what was going on. But they'd get her stable even almost overnight. They were able to get her feeling better and then after a couple days they would bring her back home. She'd be doing okay for a while and then the like same thing would happen again. And they'd say that Dorothea would come as well and she'd be completely distraught like, hands on asking them what she could do to help why is this happening and then same thing they get her nice and stabilized and send her back home and so one of these times that she's back in the emergency they end up doing a toxicology test and they find out that there's a drug that's inside of Esther that she's not prescribed and I'm not sure if just the way like the community is set up, like that Esther and Dorothea shared a doctor or how that came to light, but they communicated with Esther's doctor and he was familiar with Dorothea and he said that the drug that Esther was being given was not Esther's at all, but that he had prescribed it to Dorothea. And I guess that if you weren't supposed to take this drug, it could be really, really dangerous for your health. So they find out that this is what's making Esther really sick. And they they fire Dorothea. It doesn't sound like they ended up contacting the company that Dorothea worked for though because she continued working there and they did contact the police but they were just told that there was no evidence and basically that what they would have needed is to see her directly administer something to Esther to prove that it was her that did this and not that she accidentally took it or somebody else did it. So there was nothing that they could do. In 1980, another doctor is suspecting that one of his patients is being poisoned. Again, through that network of healthcare providers, he just happens to get in contact with somebody who was familiar with Esther's case. And she asked, does this patient have a live-in caregiver? And the doctor was like, uh, yeah, I do believe so, but I don't know the name off the top of my head. And so this woman was like, well, you need to figure it out like right away. Go look, this is super important. And so the doctor does and comes back and he's like, yeah, there is one. And the name I have on here is Dorothea. So this time, unlike in Esther's case, they don't go directly to the police because they already know that they need proof. They go to the company that she's employed through and they say, this woman needs to be fired. Like these aren't coincidences, something's going on. And again, when they get there, they're told there's not enough evidence and they have no ground to fire her. So she stays employed. They're bound and determined to try to figure out how they're gonna be able to basically catch her red-handed. And in a year that they're trying to do this, four other cases that are under Dorothea's care end up going to the emergency with the same situation. And in one case, one of the patients ends up dying and they classified it as a heart attack, basically saying there was such like a fluctuation in his health that the heart could no longer handle being really ill and then getting better and then getting sick and getting better. And so it was just, it was a heart failure. Again, nothing happens there. And that same year, Dorothea ends up meeting this gentleman at a bar, hitting it off really well. And he invites her back to his apartment. Pretty much when they arrive, he's sitting on the couch and this like paralysis comes over him so he's able to see and hear but he's not able to move his body at all and he sees Dorothea just get up and start ransacking his house stealing a bunch of his valuables like she even goes as far as 
stealing one of his own suitcases to shove all of her treasures in. And just as she's leaving, she starts approaching him. And I can imagine this guy is like shitting his pants like, oh, f oh, f I can't run away. And she kneels in beside him and grabs his hand and yanks off this pinky ring that he has. Like I imagine her like the Grinch, you know, like going and cleaning the whole place out, you know, and then going up the chimney and seeing that like a little piece of crumb falls down, goes back and like, I'll take that too. So she's trying to cash two of these checks that she's forged of his. And when they catch her, she she's like, oh yeah, he gave me permission. He told me that I'm allowed to do this. They're like, I don't think so. And she's like, no, no, yeah, he did. And you can't really trust anything he says because he's got like a psychiatric condition and he forgets what he says. If I was that person, I, I probably would have believed it. I would have been like, oh, you know, or at least I would have like looked in further and not just, I'd been like, oh, there's more to this and this is a possibility. But regardless, they do end up charging her with forgery. She doesn't go to jail though. While she's awaiting her court date, she is still roaming the streets. I don't know how many times I can say, you're really skating on thin ice here, Dot. Let's try to switch things up and maybe not, maybe not keep continuing down this path here. Not long after she's caught for doing this, she ends up meeting a older lady named Irene. And her and Irene are at a hair salon together one day. Irene ends up tripping and falling and hurting herself. Not severely, but you know, she's older and she's just fallen. And so everybody is rushing over to make sure that she's okay. Well, you know, Dorothea, the nurse, couldn't pass up an opportunity opportunity. So she heads over and she, you know, tells everybody she's a nurse and she's got this. And so she looks over Irene to make sure she's okay. And Irene says she's feeling fine. And Dorothea introduces herself as Betty and lets her know, you know, like if you need anything, just let me know. And so a couple days goes by and Irene's at home, totally fine from the fall. And all of a sudden Betty shows up at the door. She says she just wanted to check on her and make sure she was okay. She pulls out this little doctor's bag with like a little blood pressure cuff on it and straps it onto Irene and takes her blood pressure. And then she says to her, oh yeah, I, I suspected this. You're retaining way too much water right now and you need to take these water pills. So she hands her a bottle and says they were provided for her by Irene's doctor and just to take two. So poor Irene does it. And the next thing she knows, she wakes up and it's nighttime and her house has been ransacked and she's missing an expensive diamond ring. She's missing some medication and some credit cards. So she calls the police and she's able to give them just basically that Betty did this and here's the description of what she looks like. So it, it seems quite hopeless that they're ever gonna find her. But then Dorothea goes and shows how friggin' ballsy she is and she shows up to the hair salon the following week. I mean, the cojones on this woman is just insane. Like that is what older women love to do. They love to go to the hair salon, get their weekly fresh cut, their little curls like this is what they do like you know you're gonna run into her you couldn't find another hair salon and you didn't think that she was gonna go back there come on so Irene walks in and, and sees Betty sitting there and she doesn't say anything to Betty she just goes up to her hairdresser and she's like you need to call the police that's that's Betty that's the woman who drugged me before the police have a chance to get there Dorothea just you know casually gets up and tells her hairdresser goodbye she says she's going on a trip to Mexico so she's not sure when the next time she's gonna see her is and then she leaves the police get there this is where they're able to find out that her name's not Betty and that it's actually Dorothea and they have client information on her from her hairdresser so police go to arrest Dorothea and she goes to her go-to excuse she did nothing wrong it wasn't her and they're not able to find any of the missing items from Irene's house so nothing really progresses there but they still have that case from the one gentleman from the bar that she drugged and robbed so that finally goes to court she was found guilty in that case but days after she was in jail her lawyer was able to have her release and that move right there to me is just one of the biggest letdowns and miscarriages of justice because at this point, everything just escalates and takes a turn for the absolute worst. We already know that, you know, with every chance she gets after she's released, instead of doing some soul searching and reconfiguring out the life plan, she just goes back into old habits. And it's almost like each time she gets worse and worse. So a month after she's released, she meets 61 year old Ruth Monroe. Initially, Dorothea meets 
Ruth's husband, who is dying of terminal cancer. They end up meeting at a bar, having a friendly conversation, and he suggests that he bring his wife the next time he's at the bar so that Ruth and Dot can meet because he thinks that they would get along well and form a friendship. Ruth is described as a hardworking grandmother. She wasn't much of a drinker, but it seemed like as her husband's health was declining, one of his outlets was to go to the bar and drink, and so I guess it was her way of supporting him. She kind of would just follow suit and do the same. And so she does end up meeting Dorothea. And like he predicted, they get along. Of course, I mean, Dorothea can get along with absolutely anybody. And during this conversation, they quickly decide that they are going to be lifelong friends. Dot suggests that they start a catering business together. I think Ruth was just looking for something to do to distract herself and have something to work hard towards and look forward to. So she's all game. And so she puts in all of the savings that she has into a joint bank account that they start for their business. Meanwhile, Ruth and her husband start to go through a little bit of problems in the marriage. And so Dorothea suggests to her that until they work that out, how about she come and move in at her place? So on April 11th, 1982, Ruth moves into the home that Dorothea is subletting from Ricardo. About two weeks after that, Ruth goes to lunch with a old friend of hers and her friend said Ruth wasn't herself that day. She said she looked very frail and disorientated. And at some point during their visit, Ruth just breaks down and starts crying. And she tells her that she's really scared that she's dying or something's happening to her because there's nights where she'll eat something and then she'll wake up and not remember going to bed and she's feeling like she's having these laps in times and she's not feeling herself but she refused to go to the emergency and didn't want to be checked out by a doctor and that unfortunately is the last time that the friends saw each other a few days later on april 27 ruth's daughter comes to visit and she says that ruth is out cold she can tell that she's sleeping but she's in a really deep sleep that she won't wake up when she calls her name so she asks dorothea about it and dorothea said that she was really anxious and having a hard time calming down. So they ended up going to emergency where a doctor had given her a shot to get her to calm down a little bit and just to send her home to have some rest. Ruth's daughter believes that Dorothy is a nurse and she thinks that her mom's in good hands. So she ends up leaving. And I'm not sure if she had spoke to her brother or if he had already planned on stopping by, but he ends up coming later on in the evening. And when he gets there, Ruth is in really bad shape. He says she's upstairs in her bedroom and her eyes are like open and he sees like tears streaming down, but she's almost in like a comatose state where she's not saying anything to him and she's just out of it. So he asks Dorothea, you know, what's going on? And Dorothea says to him, oh yeah, um, the doctor just came by and gave her another injection because she started getting all worked up again and they really want her just to get some rest. So she should be feeling fine like tomorrow. I read, which is just so heartbreaking, that he went back upstairs and went to go give his mom a hug and said, don't worry, mom. Dorothy is here, she's gonna take care of you, and I'll see you tomorrow. And at 5 a.m., the kids get a call from Dorothea saying that the paramedics were on their way and that their mom wasn't doing well. Her kids race over to the house, but by the time they get there, unfortunately, Ruth is gone. The autopsy showed that Ruth had high levels of codeine and Tylenol in her system. And when everyone was sitting around talking about it, Dorothea suggested that she must have killed herself, you know, just based on all the stress she was dealing with her husband and maybe the new business starting up. Initially, the kids all agreed, except for Ruth's son-in-law. And he just calls a family meeting and straight up says, I think that Dorothea did this. It takes a while for him to convince the family to even go there, but eventually he does. And then they call the hospital. And that's when they find out that Ruth had never gone there that night to get any injection and no doctor had come to the house to administer drugs to her either. So they go to the police with this information and they also are told there's no evidence unless one of the children had seen Dorothy directly administer something to Ruth they couldn't arrest her at this point reading all this like my blood is just it's like boiling to the point where like the lid is flying off <sighs> Was gin supposed to taste like pine? So Dorothea drains the business account and takes all of that money that Ruth had put in. And the next month after Ruth's death, Dorothea calls one of her friends Dorothy, dot and dot. It would be adorable if you didn't know that one of the dots was just a 
psychopath. So she calls Dorothy and she sounds drunk on the phone. She says she's been day drinking because she's really upset and she's going through a lot and she wants to come over and have some drinks with her friend because she just needs somebody to talk to. So Dorothy's like, yeah, for sure, come on over. When she gets there, Dorothea says, okay, you just go sit down in the living room. I'm gonna make us some drinks and I'll tell you like everything that's going on. So she heads on into the kitchen, blends up a little drink for them. Dorothy starts drinking it. She says it's really bitter and she doesn't like the taste of it, but Dorothea just kind of like, sloughs it off and she's like don't worry it'll it'll be fine in a minute kind of like you know when you drink like a nine dollar bottle of wine the first sip is basically unbearable and then by the time you're done that glass like you can drink five more bottles kind of like that she says Dorothy is just rambling on about an investigator coming over and questioning her because somebody who was living with her had passed away and they suspect she had done something but she didn't and she's very hurt and offended and then the next thing Dorothy knows she wakes up and it's the middle of the night and she has some valuables missing and her credit card and checkbook is gone. So she calls the police and luckily for her in the blender there was still a little bit of liquid left and there was also like a powder substance on her counter. Now finally they have proof that Dorothea was directly linked to making something and somebody being drugged. So on May 19th she's arrested. In this case she takes a plea deal so that she can get a lesser charge she ends up being sentenced to five years in prison. While she's in prison, she starts writing to an older gentleman named Emerson and he's just, he's so adorable when I just look at him. He was a widower and he was really lonely. For whatever reason, he liked to have pen pals that just happened to be women in jail. Dorothea wasn't the only one, he wrote to other women, but Dorothea really laid it on thick with him and was like, as soon as I get out of here, we're gonna get married, we're gonna spend our life together, and that's really what he wanted. He was really excited about Dorothea, and he told his sister all about her. His sister, she knew about Dot, so she was a little bit hesitant and just told him, you know, like, just watch out, be a little bit cautious, but he's like, nope, she's not like that, everything's gonna be fine. So in 85, Dorothea is going to be released from jail, and she tells Emerson, you know, why don't you come and pick me up and take a little road trip and then you can come back with me and we'll live together in my place. And that seemed like a great idea to Emerson because he had a camper attached to his little red Ford pickup. So that's like what his living situation was at at the time. So, you know, getting married to this woman that he's fallen in love with, going to move on with her, he just thought he was like living the dream. So he goes and picks up Dorothea and they get back to her house. And a few days have gone by and, he, and his sister hasn't heard from him yet. So she gets a little bit worried and she calls the police station and asks if they're willing to do a wellness check on him. So they head over to Dorothea's house. Emerson's there and he is almost like irritated that they came looking for him. I'm not really sure why he was that upset, but he even called his sister and and they got in an argument over the phone that she invaded his privacy by calling and that he was really upset and just to leave him alone. So that was the last time that she ever spoke with him on the phone. She did start getting mail grams from the house though. They were coming from Dorothea. She would just update his sister on their, you know, marriage plans and how things were going and what they were up to that week. She even brought up the whole incident about the police coming like, oh, I can't believe you didn't trust me. But anyways, everything's going okay okay over here. This goes on for a couple months from Dorothea sending mailgrams and then in November Emerson starts sending mailgrams to his sister. He tells her he's left Dorothea and he's heading south and he doesn't want anybody to look for him. Based on that last conversation that they had his sister was like okay got the message loud and clear I'll leave you alone. Not long after that she starts getting mailgrams from a woman named Irene and Irene says that she has met Emerson and they are in love and they're getting married. She even makes reference to knowing that she worries about her brother and that she heard that she had once called the police on him to go and check at a house that he was living at. <laughs> Once we know that it's not Irene and we know that it's Dorothea doing that, it's like, why would you even include that? It's like she couldn't get past, almost like to the point where she gets insulted, like she did when like the husbands left her. She just had to keep like bringing it up. This period is, it's a little bit unsure. We obviously know there's no Irene. It's safe to say that Emerson had never sent any mailgrams to his sister. We do know that he did arrive in Sacramento with Dorothea and was living at the house with Ricardo. And Ricardo liked 
liked Emerson a lot. It sounds like he thought he was a good match for Dorothea. In December, Ricardo takes a trip to Mexico with his family for a few weeks. And when he comes back in January, Emerson's gone. He asks Dorothea where he is and she says that he didn't like Sacramento anymore and left. And he notices that the handyman for the residence is driving Emerson's truck. And Dorothea said he sold it to him and got a new one for his fresh start. So Ricardo didn't really have any reason to question it. But what he didn't know is that weeks before, one of Dorothea's old tenants, her name was Brenda, she was in jail and she asked her boyfriend to head over to the house and pack up some things that she had left behind. And when he got to the house, he said it smelled awful and he just made a casual comment about it. And Dorothea said to him, oh yeah, um, actually I was wondering if you could help me while you're here. There is a gentleman that had a heart attack a couple days ago and I need help burying his body. This guy was like, no, I don't want any part of it at all. He didn't see the body, so he's not able to say if it was Emerson's or not. She asked him not to tell the police and he agreed not to. My understanding is that he didn't really like live his life on the up and up. So any police involvement he wasn't keen on doing. So the next day she asks her handyman if he's able to build a junk box for her. She says that she needs something about six feet by three feet. And he's like, yeah, okay, sure. She loads it up. He doesn't see what goes inside of it, but I believe it was like a day or two after that. She asks if he can come and help her bring it to a storage unit. He's having a tough time lifting this box up. He says it's really heavy. So he asks the neighbor if he can assist him. And the neighbor comes over, they get this box in the truck. On the way to this storage unit, there's like a river. And it sounds like a lot of people in this community used it basically as like a dumping ground. If they didn't wanna to go to like the dump or pay for fees, they would just get rid of like old furniture and stuff and just dump it in the river. So as they're driving, she says, I, I don't really need this stuff again. Let's just, let's just be done with it. Will you just help me put it in the river? So he didn't think anything of it. And he just said like, yeah, for sure. So they, they dumped the box in the river. And on New Year's Day, just a few weeks after that, a fisherman finds the box and inside is the body of Emerson. Unfortunately, since he didn't have any identification on him and no one was looking for him, he was just tagged as John Doe. After Ricardo and his family come back from Mexico, they end up moving out of the home and buying another one not far away but they let Dorothea sublease it from him. So she keeps living there. And now that she's got it free to herself, she starts up the whole boarding gig again. And so for two years, she has people back living in and out of her home. Just like before, these were cases where they were the harder ones to place. So for the course of two years, she had seven tenants that had lived in her house that she had killed for their social assistance checks. Due to their situations, no one questioned or noticed that they were gone, except for the last tenant that she killed. His name was Alvaro Montoya. He went by the name Bert. And when his social workers couldn't get him on the phone after he had missed an appointment, they started probing and looking into what happened to him. He was born in Costa Rica. He didn't speak the best English. He was described as burly and very sweet, almost like a gentle giant. He had schizophrenia and mental illness, but his social workers said he just left this lasting impression and he would brighten their day and they would look forward to the days that he was coming in for his check-in. It was in February 1988 that he was placed to go and live at Dorothea's house and his social worker said that when they went for that first meeting, you know, as per her usual, she was at the top of her game, made them all feel so comfortable about him going to live there. Since she spoke Spanish, she spoke Spanish to him, so he felt comfortable. She cooked him Spanish meals, cleaned his clothes for him, she had him always like freshly shaved and his hair always nicely trimmed. And when he went in for his check-ins, the social workers noticed such a positive change. They thought that he was even starting to show less and less signs of his schizophrenia. So they're really happy with him living at Dorothea's house and things seem to be okay. But then in August, he shows up to the center and he's really angry this time. He says that Dorothea is no longer nice to him and he wants to move out of the house. 
but they don't have anywhere directly to put him that day. So they say, you know, we've got to go back there. Unfortunately, they they never saw Bert again. From what I could tell, Dorothea was slowly uh, shifting people out of his life. She had called other healthcare providers of him and said he no longer needed to go and see them, that he was fine. She had all of his banking and trust accounts signed over to her. She had put him on an allowance as well. So she had full control over his finances. The only thing that Bert was basically allowed to do was to go to the pub that was just half a block away that she also frequented. And she had set up a $80 tab there for him so he could go and have a beer and burrito a couple times a week, which he liked to do. And that was pretty much it. We know that one day in August, Bert shows up to the bar and when he gets there, before he's even able to drink his drink, the bartender says it's, it appeared that something had just hit him and he immediately appeared to be intoxicated and started passing out. So he was so out of it, they said they needed a couple people to help walk him back to the house. After that point, they never saw him come back to the bar. But they knew that Bert was living at Dorothea's house. So the next time that she came back in, they asked, you know, where's Bert? How's he doing? We haven't seen him for a bit. And Dorothea says that he's moved to Mexico and she doesn't think that he'll be coming back. So for the meantime, just cancel his tab. The last known contact with Bert was on September 2nd and he had made a call to a local post office. The woman that he spoke with said that he was very upset on the phone and she could hear a woman screaming in the background. And he kept saying, she has control over my checks she made me sign over everything. She's yelling at me. She won't let me have my money. He gave his name and his address. So the woman said she was going to look into what was going on. And we know that he ended up calling back two times that day, basically saying the same thing. And she said as soon as she had answers for him, she would get in contact with him. And a couple weeks after that is when Bert had missed his appointments with his social workers. So they start calling Dorothea. She tells them that Bert's fine, but that he wasn't at the house and she she had sent him to go visit her family in Mexico. Right away, they're like, why would you do that? So they were like, if that's true, then we need to speak to him. So Dorothea says, no worries. He's actually going to be back in a couple days. So why don't you come and see him when he's home? And then before they have a chance to come and see him, she calls them back and says, he's actually made a change in plans. They're loving him so much in Mexico. He's really loving it. He's decided he's going to stay a little longer. She's able to ward them off until November 1st. And and then they come to the point where they say they need to physically see him in order to close his file and move on. They told Dorothea she had six days to produce Bert and she said that she was going to go to Mexico herself to get him and bring him back home and that they could come to the house on Monday and talk to him. So Monday rolls around and they get a call from this man and he says that he's Bert's brother-in-law and he lives in Utah. He went to go get Bert in Mexico and bring him back to his house and as soon as he's feeling better, he'll call them and let them know that he's okay. But right now he's really sick. The social workers talk amongst themselves and they are like, we've never heard of this brother-in-law. They didn't know of any relatives that he had in Utah. So they call Dorothea back. They say they're going to call the police. When they get there, there is one of the tenants who slips a note to an officer. And in the note, it says, she's making me lie about Bert to you. So they just, you know, tuck that in their packet, pack it, pocket, do their search through the house and ask Dorothea some questions. Nothing looked suspicious at that time. So they didn't stay long that first day, but they come back the next morning. And this time they have Dorothea's parole officer because once they see that she had tenants living in the house, they realize she broke a condition of her parole. He's like, you know, you're not allowed to be doing this. And she just very cooperatively is like, yeah, you know, this is, this is very wrong. What I'm doing is wrong. I take full blame. Blame, which we know she's not usually all about. She likes to deny, deny, but that's like the lesser of her issue. So if she is going to get in trouble for something, she's like, yeah, I'll just own up to this right now. And then they ask if they can search the yard because they had spoken to neighbors who had seen some suspicious activity going on there. Dorothea had a friend named John McCauley and the neighbors had seen John digging in the backyard late at night. So they let the police know about this. And Dorothea says she 
she doesn't have a problem at all with them digging in the backyard. She just wanted them to be careful because she said she had recently planted some trees in the back. So just, you know, be delicate around those, but to go for it. And she even offers her own shovel. So two detectives go back and they're digging in the backyard for quite a while. They say that Dorothea is, you know, standing off to the side, keeping an eye out on things. And it takes a while, but eventually they feel something with the shovel and it feels like a tree root. So they bend down and they start sweeping away some of the dirt and they realize they've come across a body. And Dorothea's off in the corner and they're like, what the hell? And she just like clasps her hands to the side of her face and she's like, oh no. And acts like she has no idea where this body came from. Like how dare somebody bury a body in my backyard? So the detectives just based on first impressions of the decomposition, they realize that this can't be Bert. Based on the size of it and just how far along, Bert's body wouldn't have had that much time to decompose to that point. So they keep digging. And so Dorothea goes inside the house and she makes a drink for her and John. She goes to her bedroom and gets dressed. She puts on a really nice red pea coat and she goes down to the detective and tells him that she's not feeling well. And by this point, now that the police are digging and that they've uncovered a body, word is getting around in the neighborhood. So a crowd is forming outside of the house. And she says that she's feeling a lot of anxiety. She's very upset about the discovery they found in her backyard. And it's very unsettling to her. And she says that she's going to go down the road to the the Clarion Hotel where her, she calls him her nephew, Ricardo, works so she can have just a coffee and compose herself. And this next move is very controversial. The detectives say they didn't have enough evidence at that specific point in time. So they had no choice but to let Dorothea go. But he said that he wanted to drive her personally so that he could make sure that she was going where she said she was. So he drives her and John to the Clarion Hotel. And as soon as he leaves, John and Dorothea have a drink and John goes on his way and Dorothea gets a cab and she goes to Stockton and from Stockton she gets on a Greyhound and heads on to LA. So the detectives discover she's on the lam and people in Sacramento are pissed. They cannot believe that they just let her go and by this time they had unearthed the seven bodies on Dorothea's property. Dorothea made it to a hotel in LA and there she was able to follow everything on the news. So she was able to track and see like what progress was and where everyone was kind of at. She stayed in that room for two days, but then she started getting restless and she was running out of money and food. So she dolls herself up and heads on over to a local pub. There she orders a vodka, an OJ, and she sees a gentleman sitting by himself at the bar. His name is Charles. So she goes over to him and they start up a conversation. She says that she she is recently widowed and that she's moved to just have a fresh start and grieve. And he says that he lives on his own and he's retired. Immediately, Dorothea's ears perk up and she's like, oh, do you have some form of federal assistance? So he says, yeah, he receives about $550. And Dorothea's like, oh, honey, like I can get you at least $100 more than that. Let me help you out. He seems to entertain the idea and then she just like swings for the fences and she's like, you know what? You're living on your own. I can help you out with this. I'm recently widowed and people have been trying to take advantage of me. I'm really having a hard time trusting anybody. Why don't, uh, why don't we just live together? And he's a little bit off putting but doesn't want to be offensive. So he said he'll think about it and they exchange information. At this time, cell phones weren't very popular and not everybody was walking around with one. So she provided the information to the hotel that she was staying at. As he gets home, he cannot shake the feeling that he had seen this woman before. She looked really familiar, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. And then it hits him that he had just seen her in the news. So he calls the police and he says he thinks that he had just had drinks with the woman that's on the lam, but her name is Donna. So he's not 100% sure, but they look identical. So the police don't want her to like be suspicious or, you know, go back on the run again. So they have Charles call her at the hotel to make plans with her so that she doesn't 
leave again. So Charles calls over to the hotel and he just basically, you know, confirms the plans for the next day. And Dorothy is like, yeah, perfect. You know, glad you came to your senses and I'll see you tomorrow. So at 11 p.m. that night, Dorothea is finally arrested and Charles, he, he escaped with his life. There is no doubt that next day he would have been another victim of hers. Her friend John McCauley was also arrested, but eventually charges were dropped against him because there wasn't enough evidence but they were able to form a case against Dorothea and prove the way she had killed her tenants was through poisoning them. Some of the tenants who were still living at the house at the time of the bodies being discovered had reported to police that before some of the victims went missing, Dorothea would tell the other tenants she was going upstairs to make them feel better. And then at that point, they never saw them again. Her trial was really long. It lasted almost a year. Her defense, like every time before, was, you know, how could she do this? It wasn't her. She's this frail old woman. She's being framed. But this time the jury convicted her. They couldn't come to a decision on the death penalty though. So it was the judge that decided she would get life in prison without the possibility of parole. And this time, thankfully, she never evaded the law again. She spent the rest of her life in prison. She died on March 27th, 2011, and she was 82 years old. Up until until the day she died, she maintained her innocence still. So there was never a point in her life that she ever took ownership or admitted what she did. So yeah, you guys, that is the story of Dorothea Puentes. I apologize if for a little bit you're going to have trust issues with your grandparents. It'll pass, don't worry, I was there too. Reach out in the comments, we can talk about it, it'll be okay. But yeah, I was just, I was just so shocked at the amount of times that they had an opportunity to just keep her in prison and she was able to just manipulate her way out of it. It's just, it just floors me. I feel like there's just so many people who have blood on their hands in this case because there was just no excuse for just taking the excuse of oh like she's old especially after like the third or fourth time but that's just how I feel I'd love to know your guys's thoughts let me know in the comments below and I'd love to know if you have a case like this that just like completely blew your mind that isn't as well known you guys know I love to hear from you it makes my whole day my whole entire day that's it from me for now if you haven't already please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so, 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 so much. I will see you guys in the next video. Until then, stay safe, kids. Love each other. Love yourself. And I will see you soon. Bye.